Let's talk about potatoes. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Mash them, fry them, stick them in a stew. Samwise Ganji, we welcome you tonight. And we welcome all of you gathering tonight. I am so grateful if you're joining us live, if you're joining us for the recording, sending love from our thawing gardens to yours where the peepers have just started officially peeping don't know what other signs of spring abound where you are but sending love from our spring to yours and all of the unfurlings everywhere and as you come in feel free to welcome yourselves in the chat put in your name yeah, you know yeah, where you're from your geographic location as we would call it now also the indigenous land you occupy and as we acknowledge that we are here at Fruition Seeds on Seneca Haudenosaunee land, this is not historical information. This is present tense. These are beautiful, living, breathing, evolving, iterating, gorgeous cultures whose land we are occupying and we are grateful <laughs> to find ways to thank and include and be humble as we learn to be on this land together. So please put in the chat your name, where you're from, the indigenous land you occupy, if you know it, signs of spring you love, yes. So glad there are wood frogs singing and in Pennsylvania, welcome from West Virginia and Massachusetts from here in the Finger Lakes in Oregon, sending so much love from Cohocton right over the hill, <laughs> Illinois, Cape Cod. <laughs> Oh, yes. Welcome. Welcome. And I would also love to thank our interpreters this night. Thank you, Kira Avery, who we see now. Thank you to Miriam Lerner, who we will see soon. Thank you so much for bringing your joy and language justice to this time together. So also, I'd love to thank Matthew, who is upstairs on the computer, on the chat. So if you have any questions anytime, tuck them right into the chat and he will be hanging out there for our entire time together. Cannot wait to accompany you. So please thank Matthew and ask him any question anytime. And I'd also love to thank the Fruition crew. There are nine of us full time here at Fruition Seeds and without every single one of them, I would not be able to stand here today welcoming you with a smile on my face and potatoes in my hand <laughs> to share about potatoes. So thank you to our crew, to our incredible families, friends, communities who allow us to do this work as well. And just acknowledging the 10,000 years of ancestors, both plant and human, who have been co-adapting together so that we might be able to learn and grow and share what we love in the form of potatoes and knowledge together and hopefully for many generations to come. So next, I would love, love, love to just share that this is only the beginning of the season of our conversation about potatoes. Perhaps you saw we've been creating beautiful growing guides and in the follow-up email you will get that growing guide. You'll also get an invitation to our Seed Academy. You'll get a free PDF of our 40-page ebook, Rise and Shine, Starting Seeds with Ease and our planting calendar and tons of awesome info. And if you're enjoying the recording, Welcome. You'll find beneath the recording, you'll find a little opt-in where you can share your email and we will email you that growing guide and all of that awesome info. So yes, we are just at the beginning of our conversation. I'm so grateful we have the next hour to be together and I hope that we will continue these conversations for days, if not decades to come. So I would love to begin with a quote. And this is a quote that <laughs> I was rather delighted to stumble upon. I grew up loving, as probably you did too, Winnie the Pooh. A. A. Milne is a remarkable writer as well as illustrator. And these are some of his wise words about potatoes. What I say is that if a person really likes potatoes, they must be a pretty decent sort of person. 
<laughs> so with that in mind, <laughs> let us put our hearts and minds and potatoes tubers together <laughs> and learn how to grow a gorgeous and abundant tubers this season. So over the next hour, we're going to share a tiny, tiny bit of history of potatoes. Then we'll talk about details to keep in mind as you're planning your garden in regard to potatoes. Then we'll talk about the types of potatoes. And then we'll get dig deep into sowing potatoes, how to plant them, all of those nuances. Then we'll talk about cultivating them, a bit about harvest and storing them, and then we'll talk about the common mistakes people make and how hopefully you and I <laughs> can be well ahead of the curve. So remember, you can tuck any question anytime into the chat. Thanks again to Matthew Goldfarb, my beloved partner in life and in love for taking care of you all in the chat. And without further ado, let's talk history because we are not the first people to love potatoes. <laughs> there have been, as A.A. A. Milne would say, or at least observe, many decent, pretty decent humans for 10,000 years who have been co-adapting with these tubers. There are all kinds of the same species, same genus rather, different species all throughout Central and South America, especially in South America. But this particular species that is what we think of as potato is from the Peruvian Andes. And it is so remarkable how beautiful, how diverse in color, texture, flavor, size, anything you can think of, they are growing at such different elevations with such diversity. And what we see in a grocery store is the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Histories of colonization quickly swept potato all across the world. And now so many cultures have potatoes so deeply central to them. And most people associate <laughs> potatoes with Ireland and the potato famine more than they would Peru. We'll talk about the famine and how you can prevent at least late blight, if not <laughs> a famine in the near future. Um, so let's talk about how you can plan for abundant potatoes in your life. So first and foremost, you know for these four things. Number one, potatoes are planted early. And like all early planted crops, it's so important to really take care of your soil. And so that not means a lot of things. Ideally, you're fertilizing, you're incorporating fertility into your soil in the fall. Think of a soup. A soup is delicious as soon as you make it, but day two, right? All of those flavors meld together and it is so soup day two is the day to enjoy that soup. Similarly, if you can incorporate fertility into your garden in the fall, it has time to meld and marry and really be building the soil fertility, not just have be available for your plants. So yes, fertilizing in fall is the best time, but here we are, <laughs> happy March, happy spring. If you haven't, if you didn't fertilize in fall and you still wanna plant potatoes, you're going to harvest so many great potatoes. <laughs> and so the next best time to, incorporate fertility is when you are planting and working your soil in spring. Just be sure that you're not getting ahead of yourself and working that soil too soon. And definitely if you haven't already enjoyed our blogs and our like soil texture info and when to be actually working your soil in spring, jump on into our free Seed Starting Academy if you haven't already, because that has all kinds of great info helping you know exactly when you can be working your soil. And now let's be sure that number two, so number one is early crop, dial in your fertility, ideally in fall, and either way, don't work your soil too soon. Number two is dialing in hilling, which we'll talk a lot more about later on in our time together. But just keep in mind that hilling is such a thing for potatoes. And so having abundant materials on hand 
well planned for ahead of time just makes your life that much easier and certainly it will make your potato abundance that much easier. Next, keep in mind that early season potatoes are harvested kind of mid-July, early August, and so you've got plenty of time here in zone five to then plant a crop of carrots, beets. If you want to put in fall cabbage or broccoli, plenty of time for lots of greens. So there's so many things that you can follow, especially early season potatoes with. So you'll plant them early, but since you'll harvest them on the early side, you have plenty of time for a second crop in that same place, especially if you are just continuing to build fertility in that in your garden. And finally, plan on scouting for Colorado potato beetle as well as blight, late blight. We'll talk about Colorado potato beetles and late blight very soon. <laughs> so those are the key things to keep in mind just as you're planning your garden and planning for potato abundance. So next let's talk about types of potato. There's two ways to think about it. There's kind of texture of potato and then there is maturity, harvest dates of potato. So in the texture department, there are starchy, there are waxy, there are all purpose potatoes. Starchy potatoes have lots of starch, you guessed it. They're also really low moisture, so they love to absorb butter and sour cream and all kinds of lovely things. That also means that they love to absorb water, and so that also means that when you cook them, especially in a soup, they just kind of turn to mush. And so by contrast, waxy potatoes have less starch, more sugars. They also have lower water content, pardon me, the higher water content. And so one of the things that that means is that when you cook them, they maintain their size, they maintain their shape. And so whether it's a in a soup, in a potato salad, waxy potatoes, if you want your potatoes to maintain their shape, go for waxy potatoes. Oh, I forgot to mention, in the starchy department, a russet potato is a quintessential starchy potato. In the wax department, those lovely little fingerlings are the quintessential waxy potato. And then there are all-purpose potatoes, which are the best of both worlds. They're not as high starch or low moisture as <laughs> either the waxy or the starchy, and they maintain their shape decently, um, but not the best. And you can mash any potato. You can also fry any potato. If you really want to fry potatoes, though, starchy ones are going to do you better. Um, so just a few things to keep in mind. There's so many different colors, shapes, sizes, textures. Some are more creamy. I encourage you to try growing as many different varieties of potato as you can. Ideally three, four, more, because it's incredible. To, if you think a potato as a potato as a potato as a potato, and they are just not. Can you imagine thinking all apples are the same? Especially if you're here, shout out to all of you in short seasons in the Northeast who perhaps you know and grew up and love apple varieties just like we do. And you know that there's such a big difference between an Empire and a Macown and a Coraline and a Gala <laughs> and all of these different varieties. So yes, give lots of different varieties of potato a try. And also keep in mind that there are early, mid, and late season potatoes. Early season potatoes are harvested about 75 to 90 days. That's when they mature. Mid season, 95 to 110 days. Late season, 120 days to 135. So here at Fruition Seeds, we grow predominantly early and mid, late mid-season varieties. We don't grow too many late-season varieties, and those that we share are mid and early season as well. So another thing to keep in mind in terms of sourcing seeds and the types, you can, I mean, this is a potato, right? <laughs> and when you're growing potatoes, you plant potatoes. And here's the thing, potatoes from a grocery store We'll grow potatoes, maybe, but if they're a conventional potato, they've literally been sprayed with chemicals so that they will not be sprouting, so that they will be shelf stable 
we see you industrialized agriculture. So I don't actually recommend, I don't recommend planting them because they probably won't grow for you. I also don't recommend eating them. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. Organic seeds, on the other hand, organic potatoes rather from the grocery store haven't been sprayed with those non-sprouting chemicals. So you can't technically sprout them, but here's why I tempt you to think twice. Think about diseases and now also think about Garlic. How many of you have planted garlic before and are maybe some of you are watching your garlic. It, ours is about two inches tall right now. Yes, I love all the hands in the air. And so <laughs> garlic from the store is pretty small, right? If you get a bulb of bulb of garlic larger than a golf ball from a grocery store, that's a big one for the grocery store. And if you've bought seed garlic, you know that it's the better size of your hand. It, it's much larger because you reap what you sow. And that seed garlic is not only much larger, it's been tested for diseases. So it's disease-free, nematode-free, and that makes all the difference. So yes, the potatoes you find at the grocery store are food grade potatoes, marvelous to eat. What you find in seed grade potatoes is even a higher quality yet, and they have been tested for diseases and other ways to ensure that they are pathogen free and will be growing that much more abundantly for you. So yes, you can technically plant organic seed, organic potatoes from a grocery store. I highly, highly, highly recommend, especially if you don't want to get light in your potatoes that goes into your tomatoes to get certified seed potatoes. It makes a huge difference. So now let's talk about sowing potatoes. This moment that we've all been waiting for that is coming up, not immediately, but quite soon. And so here's just a generalization about where you want to plant your potatoes. So full sun, loose, nutrient dense soil, well drained soil is makes a huge difference for potatoes. pH for potatoes, six to 6.5, they can take a little more acidic soil than most garden vegetables. And if you haven't already tested your soil, go ahead and test it. Check out our blog about soil testing made simple. It makes all the difference. So much more you will learn besides pH. And from there, you can direct sow some seeds. You can transplant some seeds. Some seeds you can do both. <laughs> but with potatoes, we directly put them straight into the soil. Don't bother transplanting your potatoes, friends. But you can green sprout them. So let's talk about green sprouting. Green sprouting is this phenomenally brilliant technique that allows you to essentially grow your potatoes more quickly. They'll resist rotting in cold, wet soil more easily. And and you'll harvest even earlier, often two weeks earlier. So green sprouting, how do you do it? Two to three weeks before you plant out your potatoes, and we plant our potatoes in our gardens two to three weeks prior, just before our final frost. So two to three weeks before then, we begin the green sprouting process. And we do that by laying our potatoes out in a single layer with lots of light. It can be in the dark initially, but as soon as those eyes start to sprout, they need all the light they can get. And have them in a warm place. 65, 70 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal. And from there, that will encourage these eyes, once they burst, to stay short, stocky, and deep, beautiful green. If you're anything like me, you have potatoes. <laughs> that are, have sprouted in a dark kitchen cupboard and they start to turn into inches long white stalactites, <laughs> stalagmites. And perhaps you already, you even have some in your cupboard now, like we do that are sprouting. And so what you're looking for is not that, not that white looking for light sprout, but literally here's some from our cupboard actually that's starting to sprout that, oh my gosh. So, but you can see they're just starting to sprout and because they've been in our cupboard, they're 
pretty white, but if you have them suddenly exposed to the light, they will stay green, they will stay short and stocky right up next to the skin, ideal. So that is what green sprouting looks like. And you'll simply keep them in that single layer in that warm place with plenty of light for two to three weeks prior to planting. And then from there, you can cut them to plant before you plant out or you can plant them whole. And with that, let's talk about cutting. So cutting, you need at least two of these eyes, of these sprouts to have a really robust seed potato surround you with abundance. One eye, it could happen. Three eyes, even better, but two is a solid minimum. And so with, if you have this potato, for example, it's a pretty big potato. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> There's almost a dozen sprouts on this potato. So you can actually cut your potatoes, especially when they're larger. And as long as you have minimum two, ideally three eyes per piece, you can be cutting and amplifying, though you'll be growing that much more abundance from your potatoes. So keep in mind that with cutting, small potatoes, if they're one or two ounces, think a medium size egg or smaller, then you really don't wanna be cutting that in half. That's a perfect size, but if they're larger like this, I might be able to cut this into two, into three pieces. I will probably just cut this in half though. And I try to cut where I have the minimum cut possible, the minimum surface area on that cut possible. And then I let that heal over. One of the biggest common mistakes people make is simply cutting and then directly planting them in the soil. And that is just a recipe for that open wound, which is what it is to become susceptible to rot, to mold, to bacteria and fungi. But if you let it heal over even for just two days, then let that glossy cut turn matte and heal over and then plant and then you're good to go. So when do you plant? We plant potatoes two to three weeks before final frost. Potatoes can tolerate pretty cool soils, 50 degree soils. When is it soil 50 degrees, Petra? I don't know. Here's the thing. There, you can get very fancy equipment, but you probably, you may also have a thermometer in your, in your medicine cabinet. And if you do have that thermometer, you can simply put it down into the ground and you'll know. Keep in mind, you want to submerge it at the point, at the depth that you'll be sowing your potato. And so if you're going to be sowing them four inches deep, make sure that that, temp, that thermometer gauge is reading from four inches down. So, and potatoes can also tolerate a light frost remarkably well. So in all told, it's not too early to sow, uh, sow your potatoes two to three weeks before final frost, even when the soil is pretty cool. Keep in mind though that potatoes will emerge and merge faster even in warmer soils. And so honestly, you can plant, especially early season varieties, until late June here in zone five, until think like four or five, even six weeks after your final frost date, wherever you are, you can plant potatoes that are early season and be confident that they, you will still harvest a lovely abundance of potatoes. And also in this department, <laughs> keep in mind that because you're burying potatoes and pretty deeply compared to most seeds, they take longer to germinate, to emerge from the soil. So keep an eye out for them, but two to three weeks is what it will take for your potatoes often to emerge out of the soil. So a bit of patience, it's true, is part of growing potatoes. And how deep do you sow potatoes? Two to four inches in a trench. We will create this two to four inch furrow. And then you plant them one foot away from each other in the bottom of that furrow. And then those furrows can be 30 to 36 inches apart. Those rows can be 30 to 36 inches apart, depending on you know, your fertility, how you're planning on weeding and or mulching and or hilling, lots of variables in there. But give them more space than less because that hilling, which we'll talk about so soon, takes up quite a bit of energy and space. 
So in this sewing department, I always like to mention companion planting as well as succession sewing. And with companion planting, you really don't companion plant with potatoes, alas. That being said, because the hilling that they go through <laughs> is very specific to potatoes. Not many other plants will survive. Most of them will very promptly die <laughs> if you were hilling them like you will hill your potatoes. That being said, planting alliums nearby like leeks, like onions, like garlic, like chives, like scallions, alliums have lots of sulfur compounds that the Colorado potato beetle doesn't like at all. And so planting alliums in proximity to your potatoes is a nice way to help discourage those crafty, and ravenous Colorado potato beetles. So in the succession planting department, again, we don't really succession plant potatoes because they are such long season potatoes. That being said, I highly encourage you planting early, mid and late season varieties so that as you are growing your potatoes, you can be eating them and eating them all throughout the summer into the fall and have plenty for winter. And then that way you're getting tasting the diversity as well. But so think of succession sowing, not like planting one variety, pl digging your potatoes and then planting more, but rather just from the beginning, plant lots of different varieties with different ages of maturity and you will be that much more surrounded by potato abundance. So now let's talk about cultivating your potatoes now that you've planted them. So hilling is the most major piece of this. So potatoes, fun fact, only grow above the mother potato. So you plant this mother tuber and potatoes don't grow off to the side. They don't grow down. They're actually growing above that mother potato. So hilling is the easiest way to amplify your abundance because you're not only adding like growing medium for those potatoes to grow in, you're, grow, you're adding nutrients so that your potatoes can soak them up and turn them into more tubers. So yes, it also prevents, hilling prevents potatoes from greening. And you'll see that when potatoes, if they're growing too close to the surface, they will literally turn green. They'll start to photosynthesize and they will start to sprout <laughs> leaves so that they can grow more leaves, so they can grow more potatoes, which is all well and good. But in our gardens, we <laughs> want them to not be green in the summer. Also, perhaps you've tasted a really bitter potato or like now, if I were to eat this sprouting potato, it has this incredible bitter flavor from the chlorophyll, among other things, just all of those enzymes of the potato coming back to life, not just starches, not just sugars, all of these other things are happening enzymatically. So hilling is a wonderful way to prevent greening, premature greening on your potatoes. And so other fun facts, hilling, I'm gonna be describing burying your potato plant in compost, soil, straw, literally potato stems turn into roots when they're buried. I don't really know any other plant that we grow in our gardens like this. Lots of plants like tomatoes and corn, they'll create aerial roots, but that's really different. If you bury a, a, a potato stem, it's going to literally turn into a root and start producing tubers instantly. So yes, potatoes, you are miraculous and we love you. We have so much to learn from you. Um, so yes, how do you hill? Once your potato plant has emerged and is eight inches tall, then you bury them with four inches of material, whether it's soil that you've mounded up from the sides of your plants, from the rows, or maybe it's compost. We have glorious compost on our website, friends, if you didn't already know. And if you're local and you can actually pull up to your far to our farm <laughs> with five gallon buckets and with trucks and we're open actually this next weekend, the final weekend of March through the final weekend of May, we're open on the weekends between 10 and two. And yeah, we'll have compost abundant to share with you from our dear friend, John Hunt. 
And so once your potato is eight inches tall, then you hill it halfway, four inches, you bury it with soil, with compost, with grass clippings. Maybe you have abundant deciduous leaves that have been composted. Maybe you have a lot of straw or old moldy, pretty seed free hay. All of these are great options. Whatever you have in abundance is actually the best option. And so you'll, once you've hilled them by half and the eight inch plant is now just four inches, let it grow another two, three weeks. Once it's eight inches tall again, hill it another by half. And so you'll keep going every few weeks and potatoes only get about three feet tall, sometimes more if they are just incredibly surrounded by fertility. And often we have one foot of hilled material. So it's like these green plants on these glorious mounds. <laughs> and that just, again, allows all of those extra materials to be growing material, growing media for more potatoes to grow in. And also the more nutrient dense you can make that soil, those materials you're hilling with, the more nutrient dense and abundant your potatoes will be. So yes, now, now let's talk about weeding really quick. So weeding, you don't have to think about as much for potatoes because honestly, hilling effectively weeds for you, right? So another reason to <laughs> hill early and often. And now let's talk about feeding your potatoes because although potatoes are incredibly abundant, generally you harvest 10 tubers for every one tuber you plant. Isn't that amazing? Potatoes are just remarkable creatures. We love you. So although potatoes without much TLC will totally take care of themselves and grow pretty abundantly, there is a direct relationship between the quantity and quality of nutrients that they have access to and the quality and quantity of abundance you will harvest. And so it's important to be feeding them in all kinds of ways. Here are the key times to feed potatoes. Number one, incorporate fertility into your soil before you even plant them, ideally the fall before. But if not then, in the spring is wonderful. And even if you're incorporating our organic slow release organic fertilizer or granular fertilizer as you're planting and compost as you're planting, put that right into the trench as you're planting your potatoes. And that is awesome. <laughs> that is phenomenal. Your potatoes will soak it right up and surround you with abundance. And next, it's important to, once they are one foot tall, we start foliar feeding our potatoes with fish and kelp emulsion every week. And it's important to note that as a general rule, feeding your potatoes with a low or at least balanced nitrogen fertilizer is critical. If it's too nitrogen heavy, like we do have our chicken compost crumbles on our website, and those are brilliant, but those are brilliant, especially for crops that love nitrogen. Nitrogen creates abundant foliar growth, so leaf growth, rather than flower and fruiting growth. So anytime you're growing potatoes, tomatoes, anything that's a flower or fruit, you wanna make sure that your fertility is really balanced and not overemphasizing nitrogen, which is why our fish emulsion is fish and kelp emulsion. You can get just regular fish emulsion too, that generally is much higher in nitrogen. So adding the kelp in there really beautifully balances it out. So once, our potatoes are one foot tall, we foliar feed or root drench every two weeks with this fish and kelp emulsion. If you have compost tea, that's another great option. Don't think twice. And finally, next rather, flowering. Potatoes have the most beautiful star-shaped flowers. Sometimes they're pink, sometimes they're lilac, other times they're white, and they are always so beautiful. They look like little shooting stars. And potatoes start to flower for whatever reason when they are initiating tuber development. So you know as soon as your potatoes start to flower that they are putting tons of energy into producing more potatoes. And so what that means is that as soon as we see flowers, we don't skimp 
on water as well as our fertility. So that is a key time if you're not already putting healing at that moment, just give them an extra dose of fish emulsion and an extra little dose of whether it's compost or our granular fertilizer. Also, I'd love to mention that perhaps you've seen in its almost final call for sprouting your own ginger here in late March. And we have Matthew, my partner on the chat, loves to dial in fertility. And so dialing in micronutrients and just amendments for particular crop types. And so we've created across the years, he's dialed in this ginger fertilizer, which is great for rhizome development, and in truth, we put this on all of our root crops. So whether it's potatoes, put, <laughs> carrots, um, beets. So know that that is a phenomenal way to get quality nutrients that will very directly emphasize root and tuber development and not just um, more foliage. So. The next thing to keep in mind is that your final opportunity to be feeding your plants abundantly is when you hill. And I can't overemphasize this enough. Hilling is not just creating a growing medium for additional potatoes, it's creating additional nutrients so that there's more potatoes and more nutrient dense and thus more delicious potatoes. So when you hill, our friend, Last year we visited their garden and they had these beautifully hilled potatoes, but just with straw. And they hardly had any potatoes in them because they weren't watering enough and just straw didn't have that many nutrients. So keep in mind that you're hilling not only for growing media, but for fertility. And now let's talk about growing potatoes in containers. And then we'll talk about pests, disease, and harvest, and storing potatoes, so much more to come. So containers. Potatoes are glorious to grow in containers. Just make sure that two phrases that I never use apart from container gardening, <laughs> bigger is better, <laughs> and more is more. <laughs> so again, phrases I never use in my life apart from container gardening. Bigger is better. In for potatoes, 10 gallons minimum. And we have some wonderful 10 plus gallon containers on our website that we love and grow potatoes in each year. And here's the thing, bigger is better because no matter how big your container is, that access to nutrients in the soil is still a thimble compared to what they have in the soil, in your garden soil itself. So because yes, potatoes don't need a ton of extra love and care, but don't skimp on fertility. And so pack that, make that soil as in the, as much of the soil, as big a container as you can find. And then more is more, more fertility, more nutrients, whether it's tons of compost, our granular fertilizer, our ginger fertilizer that is great for root development, just pack it in and your potatoes will know the difference instantly. And then here's the thing, because potatoes <laughs> grow above the mother potato, not a side or below, they grow above that mother potato amazingly. If you fill up your container right at the, to the top, right at the beginning of the season, you it's much harder to hill. And so only fill that container one half to two thirds full. And depending on if it's wider, you can go more like half. If it's taller, do more like two thirds. And so you want so that and that way you'll have plenty of room to hill for the rest of the season so yes not filling your container right to the top is a key for growing potatoes and containers and finally i just love to share this little thought an invitation that at the end of the season you get to harvest your potatoes if you're growing them in containers you get to push them over rather than dig them out 
if you so choose. My father is a wonderful human and a wonderful gardener, and I'm so grateful to have been raised in his garden. And every year we had a beautiful half gallon of a wine barrel, pardon me, half wine barrel that we would grow potatoes in. And at the end of the season, we would grow purple and red and white potatoes. And at the end of the season, my sister and I got to push over that half gallon of half wine barrel of potatoes and it was so much fun to send the soil and the potatoes just spilling out and then it was like Easter all over again with these brilliantly colored eggs that we got to harvest and it was so much fun and I still love to do that with our little friends on the farm so I highly recommend pushing your potatoes in containers over to harvest them and next let's talk about pests so guarded pest insects, right? It's all so relative. So the main pest of, of, of potato is the Colorado potato beetle. Some, they can get thrips too, they can get aphids. They aren't generally a big deal. Colorado potato beetles, by contrast, are a big deal deal. And they're beautiful. They're in the scarab family. And be sure to take a look at our growing guide it has lots of beautiful pictures of them as an adult and also as their bright orange eggs and their pudgy umber larva. <laughs> And so it's very essential to be scouting, looking for them in your garden very proactively. Honestly, anytime from mid-June sometimes, late June, you'll start seeing them arrive. And you'll find the adults initially fly in and they're beautiful in the scarab family. They're just gorgeous. If you see them, squish them. It's hard. It's so hard. If you don't want to squish them, collect them into a little container that you can then have water in and drown them or bring them to your neighbor's chickens. <laughs> chickens love to eat them. <laughs> and so, but, and they also are very mm, evasive. You can, <laughs> it's like, as they know that fingers are coming in, they just bring their legs in and fall off the foliage. <laughs> it's a brilliant maneuver. Clearly they've been adapting to predators for a long time. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. So I love to actually come in with my hand or a cup underneath them. And then if I can't squish them with my one hand, I get to like hopefully collect them as they fall into that <laughs> little container. So squishing them, essential. You also can scout for and their eggs and their larvae. So if you are, their eggs are going to be bright, almost like tang orange. And on the underside of the leaves, they're always, they lay them in these beautiful masses of dozens and dozens and dozens of them. So they're quite easy to see. And they're often the size of a dime, um, but always on the underside of the leaves. So when you're scouting, be scouting and lifting up leaves, turning them over so you can really be looking for them. And then when you find those eggs, just squish them. That's honestly my favorite, if I can say that, life stage to kill potato beetles in because it's just the easiest. It's that hard shelled scarab beetle is definitely this like crunch that I like physically <laughs> vomit a little bit every time. I cringe every time. All these years and thousands of potato beetles later, I cringe every time. But the eggs are very soft, of course, so they're much easier. But then there's the larva. And when they are small, they're easy to squish, but it's so gross. And when they're huge, it's just disgusting. But they are so ravenous. And Colorado potato beetles, their whole thing is just eating the foliage. And if they eat the foliage, it just is a little munch. And then it's a little munch, but then they're this very hungry. It's just like the Eric Carl book, the very hungry caterpillar, the very hungry Colorado potato beetle will decimate your potato foliage very quickly. And so squish them. Sometimes if they're really big and fat as a larva, I just Oh, that's my least favorite stage to be squishing them. And I'm, I'll collect them into a container and then I'll like squish them with my foot on a rock or something. Oh, it's very gross. I'm sure you can see me. I don't even like talking about it. 
<laughs> but it's so important because they are so ravenous <laughs> and they very quickly, you can easily control their population if you're scouting and actively looking for them. But as soon as they start to, and a few killing a few will go a long way. And so then you're not like just having oceans of them <laughs> suddenly that you're really struggling and to kill them and so and your potatoes are struggling to survive so other ways to prevent Colorado potato beetles in your life. You can, they also feed on other solanaceous weeds. So just keeping your garden well weeded and especially with those solanaceous weeds is an awesome way to help reduce your Colorado potato beetle population. Also floating row cover is so handy. It excludes all kinds of insects, whether you're excluding cucumber beetles from cucumbers, zucchini, watermelon, whether you are excluding um, cabbage worms and cabbage looper from all of your broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all of your brassicas. They also can exclude Colorado potato beetles from your potatoes. So you put the hoops over, the floating row cover over, that's another way. And here is another way. You can actually plant early season varieties late and you, your Colorado potato beetles will be flying over your garden, going to someone else's garden up farther north. And they just keep moving farther and farther north with the seasons. And they don't overwinter here, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, so you can plant here in zone five, we can plant early season varieties. So they're early maturing, even by the end of June. And we'll harvest late harvest of potatoes, but we almost always don't have any Colorado potato beetles on that final succession of potatoes. So now let's talk about diseases. Oh my gosh, dun, dun, dun. With diseases, the two main diseases we have here in the Northeast are scab and late blight. And scab isn't a big deal. It's a bacteria and honestly, it's mostly cosmetic. It is conferred through the tuber. So it's really important that like seed potatoes are tested to be scab free, but it's not like it's going to rot in storage. They'll store just as long. So it's really just a cosmetic thing, but there are, it's about scab, that's the story. Late blight by contrast is incredibly devastating. Not only because blight will, this late blight will affect your potatoes, it also will leap over that same species that affects your potatoes can leap over into your tomatoes. So, and you'll see the foliage starts to turn brown and honestly, the whole plant just kind of liquefies in short order. And so the potatoes aren't delicious after a certain very young point and then just they won't store which is kind of what happened among other things in the Colorado Colorado potato famine <laughs> in the Irish potato famine um, that lay blight just this could the tubers did not store so with lay blight it's really important to be scouting for it as well and you'll see you can go online and look at photos. You can also send in foliage to your local extension agency. And they, it's actually, they love it when you do that because then they're constantly tracking for farmers. Where is late light? How fast is it moving and where? So they love it when they get samples of potential of pathogens that could be something as virulent as late light. And so definitely lean into your regional extension services for actually taking a piece of foliage and identifying it without any ifs, ands, or buts. And as soon as you have, and if you think you have, honestly, it's better to be proactive in this. If you think you have late flight, harvest the entire plant. If they're young potatoes and they look just fine, you can actually eat them. Don't store them, but you can eat them and they're still delicious. But as all of that foliage that is being affected, all of the, the entire plant, if even if there's like a little quarter inch and you're like, I don't know, maybe it's blight. And if it's continuing to expand for a couple days, go ahead and harvest the entire plant. And that foliage 
just like when a potato gets, a tomato gets light blight, take that entire plant, put it in a plastic bag, ship it off to the landfill, which I really don't love sending anything to the landfill. But here's the thing, as a fungal disease, it's spread by spores and so quickly. And spores are a single cell. And once our visually we're able to see light blight, it's sporulating. And so, and millions of these spores, right? So it's so important to immediately just envelop it, put it in a closed plastic bag, send it to the landfill so that you won't be infecting your garden or any of your neighbors farms or gardens so it's so important to be taking care of disease in that way of late blight in that way as well and here's a few keys just to keep in mind because right with organic agriculture prevention is the best cure and so there are certain degrees that we can't avoid getting diseases and insects in uh, pest insects in our crops but it, amazingly and not perhaps counterintuitively, sick, unhealthy plants are more susceptible. Unhealthy plants are less, are less resilient, more susceptible to disease. And so in the same way that if I'm not sleeping well, if I'm not eating well and I'm stressed, that's when I get sick, right? And if you're anything like me, and same is true, those Colorado potato beetles, they're actually going to land. They're intentionally like... Plants, animals, this world is so amazing. They are, they know what plants are the most stressed and they are landing on the most stressed plants that you have and they're eating those first, miraculously. And so here, just a, a little laundry list of tips so that just in general, you can have healthier plants, including potatoes, including everything. So number one, nutrient dense soil. So just making sure you're getting a soil test and dialing in your pH and your micro macronutrients so that they all are that much more healthy and abundant. Number two, not overcrowding plants. So potatoes, you plant one foot away from each other. And if they're too close, they're going to be having that much more competition for light above the ground, nutrients below the ground, and also there's going to be more humidity in the overlap of the foliage. And that humidity, water is the primary vector for every disease on the planet. So the more that you can increase airflow and decrease humidity in your garden, the less specifically disease you will have in your crops. So in that, speaking of water, watering your soil rather than the foliage makes a huge difference for absolutely everything, but especially for plants that are susceptible to blights like tomatoes and potatoes. Water the soil, not the foliage. And crop rotation, so key. And potatoes are in that solanaceous family, that nightshade family, along with potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, ground cherries, tomatillos, a delectable family indeed, but you need to be rotating all of those crops, ideally only growing those crops in a given place once every three years. And that way you can be sure that you're not transferring diseases. And also they all just require some similar nutrients in the soil. So you want to diversify, let me count the ways. And finally, and I do mean this very intentionally as the final way to be approaching organic disease prevention is through disease resistance. And so there are disease resistant potatoes. You'll find on our website, tons of potatoes. We have eight delectable varieties and the vast majority of them have one, if not more disease resistances. So take a look and also pay attention to what it is that you have. So then if you know that late light is an issue in your area, be sure that you get a late light resistant variety. Or if you really don't wanna deal with Scab, even though you know it's just cosmetic, that's totally valid. <laughs> and go ahead and be sure that you're getting a scab resistant variety. 
and then take notes. It's time for a shameless plug. <laughs> if you haven't already seen, we have these beautiful calendars or across the seasons calendars. They're perpetual calendars. So as a perpetual calendar, there are dates, one, two, three, four, five. And instead of Monday through Sunday, we have years. So here you can see all my notes from April 2020. And here's April 2021 to come. And so you can see all of these different notes that I'm taking. And so you can write in when you start your potatoes green sprouting, when you plant your potatoes, and then when you harvest potatoes. And it's so much fun to look and see what is going on. And we, and we call it across the seasons because as you're paying attention and seeing those emergent patterns across the seasons, you can be amplifying your abundance that much more. And I just wanna show you in the back too. There's this whole let's dig in section that has on each half of the page is dedicated to a particular crop. So here I have all the details for garlic and here is all the details for tomatoes and potatoes and lettuce. And there's many pages of these so that you can be seeing instead of, you know, it's really nice to have the entire juxtaposition of everything and I put not only our garden info on here, I'm also putting in when the black-throated blue warblers return and when the ramps are emerging and all kinds of things. So, um, but if you want to not have all of that and all of that info together, but just see exactly where your potatoes are, they are, all, all your potato info will be right here. And also take a peek at the very beginning, we have our direct sow chart and our transplant chart just there, ready, waiting for you. So there's lots of ways to take notes and that is but one. And now let's talk about harvesting and storage. So you can harvest your potatoes anytime, honestly, after your, your flowers, flowering on your potatoes, you've got potatoes that you could harvest and you can harvest new potatoes with that lusciously thin skin that has the most incredible melt in your mouth texture. Those new potatoes are just a 100% garden phenomena or at a farmer's market. You'll never find them at a grocery store because the skin would just fall off and not look beautiful by the time they went through that industrialized system. So you can harvest those anytime within one to three weeks of your potatoes flowering. That And that's about seven to eight weeks after you've planted your potatoes. That's kind of the window of when to harvest a new potato. And then when you're harvesting your potatoes, you've got some options. Harvest them with a digging fork, ideally, rather than a shovel and give them a wide berth. Potatoes do, they all grow above that mother potato, but they do grow outside, not just stacked above, but they'll be to the side as well. So I always give them at least a foot, if not 16 inches of putting that digging fork into the ground so that I'm giving them a nice wide berth because there's nothing more sad although I'm, I'll happily eat them that night for dinner. Those punctured tubers, <laughs> I try to puncture as few as possible. So giving them as wide a berth in the harvest process as possible sets you up for success. And you can also harvest whole plants or partial plants. If you want to dig the whole plant, of course, I won't stop you, but you can also harvest a partial plant just by not with a digging fork, but with your hand, just kind of digging into gently that side of the potato plant and just pulling out the tubers that you want, leaving all of the above ground plant up there healthy, photosynthesizing, ready to create more tubers. So that's always fun. It's like, stealing an egg from underneath a sleeping hen. <laughs> and now let's talk about the transition to storage. If you're harvesting potatoes at the end of the season for storage, it's vital that that skin be thick. And so you want to wait until the th skin of that 
potato has thickened two weeks after the plant foliage has died back. When, and at that point, with that two weeks of thickening skin, they will store beautifully. To store them, you want to make sure that you do not wash them. Washed potatoes have a much smaller storage life. And while unwashed potatoes, you can store, I mean, here we are still eating them. If you're not washing them, also keep them in a dark and a moist place, in a cool place, 38 degrees to 45 is the dream. And then airflow is really helpful for anything that you're trying to store so that the air isn't stagnating and any of those potential bacterial fungal spores just proliferating. So here are the common mistakes that people make. There are four of them. Number one is planting too early in wet soil and simply potatoes will rot. So it's very tempting in these really warm, <laughs> super warm spring days in March here in zone five, we're like, wow, it's time, it's summer <laughs> and it's going to snow again. I hate to break it to you. Your peas aren't going to mind, neither are your radishes, neither is your arugula. <laughs> Go ahead and plant your spinach, yes, but something like potatoes. It's really that two to three weeks before final frost, you really want to be respectful of that because otherwise your, your potatoes will are likely to rot, especially if it's a wet spring. They're even more likely to rot. Next, planting too deep is a really common mistake. If you plant them too deep, they'll just take a lot longer to emerge, but more often planting deeper the soil just isn't as warm and is that much more wet. And so they're that higher likelihood of rotting. And next, not next common mistake and easy solution, common mistake is plant, just cutting a potato and planting it. Solution, just let it heal over for two days. <laughs> and it might seem like the day is going to be perfectly beautiful and that's the day, but trust me, we have rotted more potatoes by not healing them over well than I would love to admit. <laughs> but here I am admitting it so that perhaps you don't have to <laughs> suffer from the same hubris. And a final common mistake people make, not hilling enough. So, and really skimping on fertility, not hilling early, not hilling often enough. I can't overemphasize, you're not just creating more material, more media for your potatoes to grow in, you're really feeding those potatoes. So don't skimp in the fertility department with potatoes, especially when it comes to hilling. So there you have it, friends. There is so much more to share, and I'm delighted to share so much more with you in the coming days, weeks, months, years, all the seasons to come. Whether it's on social media, I look forward to continuing the conversation over email. I look so forward to inviting you to the farm one day as well. And in the meantime, you'll find our fish and kelp emulsion, our across the seasons calendar. You'll find our floating row cover. Right now we have glorious potatoes and to share and we'll have those in person here on the farm as well. Every, we'll have them starting in mid-April and I can't wait to share them with you. So don't be shy and thank you to Matthew for being in the chat and responding to everyone's questions. Thank you to Kira. Thank you to Miriam for providing such beautiful ASL interpretation around a round of virtual applause for all of our friends here. And let's just read that AA Milne quote one more time before we say goodnight. What I say is that if a person really likes potatoes, they must be a pretty decent sort of person. Thank you for being such decent people, <laughs> friends. And thank you for joining us on this beautiful spring evening. Sending love from our gardens to yours. And please come off mute <laughs> to say good night. And we bid you a joyful adieu. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, friends. Bye. Till next time. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you,
<laughs> Thank you. Happy sewing. Happy spring. <laughs>